Okay, is everybody uh, comfortably? Great. Could you please turn off your cell phones? Just a reminder. And I see our speaker is already in the jury box. Or the, 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 the what? The witness box. That's a great place for him to be. In any case, uh, welcome to Keepers of Orange County's Cats, the exhibit and the lecture series. This is the sixth lecture in this series that has covered everything from dinosaurs like Brontosaurus to uh, dolphins to tonight's speaker on sea level and climate change. This has been a remarkable experience for many of us because we were able to install the exhibit across the hall that I hope you had a chance to visit already today, but this afternoon, excuse me, this, after, this evening after the speaker's done, we will have the gallery open for another half hour or hour, and the hors d'oeuvres and drinks will continue. You can also buy a copy of the book if you like the collection, which I'm sure you will actually. So at the Cooper Center is the organization that takes care of all the fossils and artifacts that have been recovered from Orange County construction and development projects. They've been doing that by law since 1977, and we have four or five decades because we inherited material of fossils, artifacts, and historical objects at the Cooper Center. We're doing that in order to do research on them, more importantly, to help the public understand about the history of life in Orange County. And that's what this series of lectures has been focused on as well, the history of life in Orange County and other places, to, as we'll hear tonight. So, importantly, we've alternated between sort of paleontology and geology on the one hand, and archaeology and anthropology on the other. So we've had speakers who've dealt with climate change, with dinosaurs, as I said, and speakers who've dealt with uh, what the Native Americans ate, what they uh, used here in Orange County. Tonight's speaker is Brian Fagan, who has written, he said, somewhere around 50 books, not just in archaeology or climate change or the history of relationship between humans and these sorts of things, but also on saving, on editing, and a variety of other things. He has done a remarkable job of service to the public by bringing to the attention of many public organizations and governmental organizations the history of climate change and sea level rise and water and many other things in our uh, country and, in fact, in the entire world. He has a remarkable history starting as an archaeologist in, after he graduated from Cambridge University. Uh, remarkable history working in Africa where he spent nine months every year for seven years. So he's very firmly grounded in field work, which is what I like about him best. What I like about him second best are his books. And I've read five of them and only have 45 more to go, I guess. But they are remarkably good. I'm going to ask Janine Peterson to introduce Brian, but before I do that, I want to thank Griselda Castillo and Bradley Flint. Where are you? There's Griselda over there. Bradley, where are you? They are our partner in the partnership between the University at Fullerton and Orange County Park. And Griselda and Brad helped us put this exhibit and this series together. Without them and the cooperation of Orange County Park, we would be nothing. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I just wanted to share a personal note about the first time I met Brian. He might not remember, but I do. <laughs> uh, he came to speak on Catalina Island, where I worked for many years. And it was over 10 years ago, and I was so excited because when I uh, was first becoming an undergrad, I was studying history, and my first anthropology class was Archaeology 101, and he wrote my textbook. So there are all very few textbooks that I've kept over the years, and that was one of them. So I came to the library.
lecture with my textbook and he signed it for me. And then I was very lucky that the next day I had to go to the mainland for something and I happened to be on the same boat as him. He invited me to sit with him and we had about an hour long conversation with him and his wife and it was probably one of the most profound and poignant conversations I've had in my professional career. And he had inspired a lot of students and people in the field of anthropology and archaeology and just really happy to have him here tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored and flattered to be here. I am coherent. I've been suffering from Orange County freeways. I'm not used to this. Anyway, what I'm going to do tonight is tell you the story of rising sea levels. And this all began as a project when I was at an Aspen environmental forum in Aspen, which was a rather weird gathering, except for a retired Bangladeshi major general who gave a 20 minute talk on rising sea levels and their implications for the country of Bangladesh which lies, as you may or may not know, about 38 feet above sea level. And he told us some of the stakes involved. Rising populations, shortage of agricultural land, hostile neighbors, and nowhere for people to move as sea levels rose and as groundwater was aggressively contaminated by said sea levels. And then he told us, which reduced the audience to silence, that they estimate, and these are government estimates, that within the next 50 years, and my friends, that's not a long time in the future, they estimate that they will have to move, are you ready for this figure, between 10 and 20 million Bangladeshis. And there was nowhere for them to go. And you could hear a mosquito clear its throat a mile away as he said this. He shook us. And I went home and I thought to myself, I really should look at the history of sea levels. Because humans have adapted to sea levels for hundreds of thousands of years. But the first thing I had to do is clear away the undergrowth. And the undergrowth is sensational scientific journalism. I am sick and tired of sensational scientific journalism. Let me right now say that I am not going to talk about the validity or otherwise of humanly caused global warming. That is not a debate about what we're talking tonight. I am not going to talk about the impending Armageddon, the flooding of New York. Sorry, I'm being a new projector and projection chamber at the bottom. The flooding of New York. I'm not really going to talk about warming, except the remark that we live in a warming world. And one of the consequences of this has been a gradual rise in sea levels. about 300 feet below those of today. Siberia was joined to Alaska by a low line. 
dying land bridge. The North Sea between England and the continent, believe it or not, was dry land. Huge continental shelf extended out from Southeast Asia. There were only about 50 miles of open water between Asia and Australia. And, regrettably, England was part of the continent. <laughs> and then, as natural global warming kicked in, sea levels rose irregularly but rapidly for about six or seven thousand years until they stayed in the game and stabilized again in about six thousand BC. In 1932, a trawler trawling for fish on Dogger Bank in the middle of the North Sea dredged up a large lump of feet. And when it fell on his deck, out of it dropped a beautiful bone harpoon. The old spear of the beaver harpoon. Now, what was interesting when the archaeologists saw this was that this was identical to spearheads found on dry land on both sides of the North Sea. And in subsequent occasions, particularly after World War II, people began to investigate the margins of the North Sea. And from this, and the use of oil surveys, they were able to show that the North Sea was dry land. It was a sunken continent known to geologists as Doggerland, after the highest point of land. In this live about, they estimate, this is a fair estimate, about 10,000 people, all of them living in small hunting bands and constantly on the move. Here's a map of the North Sea in about 16,000 or five. Look at the continental shelf. There was a deep trench between what is now Norway and the northern shore of Norway. There's the modern land landscape. Ice sheets cut Scotland and parts of Ireland. And then, between about 16,000 and about 5,000 BC, the water rose directly. Now, people, when they think of rising sea levels, think of whoosh. What you should think of is whoosh, whoosh. And in places where there are very reduced topography, like there is in this very low lying area, the sea level rose, but the water spread horizontally much more than it spread vertically, because the effect of even a modest rise was very, very marked on horizontal territory. And it's been estimated that some of the human beings who lived there, the hunters, they were all hunters, probably, say, were born on the banks of a bay, maybe around here, and at the shores of one of the numerous rivers and lakes, a lot of this was wetland, saltwater marsh. They were born, born by a bay. By the time they died, the bay would not exist. The landscape would look completely different. There were places where the land would, or the water would rise perhaps as much as two or three miles in a year. These people lived in and around the water. They lived in small hunting bands. They were constantly on the move. And they lived in small category shelters. They lived on fish, birds, game, and plant foods. And it's clear that they spent a great deal of their time in shallow water, probably in dugout canoes. Now, the advantage of all this is that you're not tied to the land like we are here. Water comes up, you move. You're moving anyhow, spring and summer. Seasons of game, the seasons of wild vegetable foods, 
vibrations, fish lungs, and so on. So the moon of Leo to the ocean would have been a small map. In societies where most of the bands were a few families, and these families had connections with other bands. Can you imagine a world in which maybe in your lifetime you met maybe 30 people? Because that's what life was like. Very different. So adjusting to higher sea levels, and by 5500 BC, the North Sea was an ocean. And England, Kurafra, was separated from the continent. The people simply moved on the higher ground on the other side of the North Sea. So adjusting to radically new circumstances were very easy and straightforward. The sea level rise, and I'm going to take my jacket off if you don't mind, excuse me, not so. I have two things to like. The one, or three things, one is politicians, another one is jackets, and the third one is tires. <laughs> anyway, let me give you another talk. The sea level was a globe. By 9000 BC, Alaska was separated from Siberia. By that time, small numbers of Native Americans were living in the Americas. The Mediterranean also rose, and the rise was very rapid. Contemplate for a moment, and some of this is somewhat clear, what is now known as the Black Sea. which is joined with the Mediterranean the Sea of Mara and the narrow Bosphorus upon which is the great city of Constantinople. Now, until about 5500 BC, or a little earlier than that, the Black Sea was a glacial lake fed by ice sheets of meltwater from the north. There was But as the sea levels rose, and apparently somewhere around 5500 BC, maybe during the storm, the water burst, and the Mediterranean cascaded into the Euxine Lake, which is about 200 feet lower than the Mediterranean at that time. And things completely changed. Here was the ancient shore. Here's the modern Black Sea. And along the shores, there were concentrated relatively dense populations of farmers. How do we know that? Simply because of the landscape. What happens if you're a farmer living in a village, and suddenly, and some people estimate this happened within two months, the Black Sea flood? You can imagine in Canada. Abandoning fields, maybe with dwelling crops, driving their cattle to higher ground, probably people drowned, and intense conflicts between neighboring communities, and a major natural disaster. It is thought by some people that the spread away from the shores of the Black Sea resulted in the spread of farmers into temperate Europe, into the forests in this region. So much of this we still don't understand. We're looking at an area of science which is very much still in its infancy. What was the impact? And when you have farming villages, you're far more vulnerable than you are if you live in a small country. I'm sorry, this is a new um, point of that I have a little trouble with. You will like anything. Now this lecture is a jump from ancient to modern. If you came here you know, expecting a lecture on archaeology, you ain't going to get much more. Because the issues that all of this raises today are terribly, terribly important. Let's take the Nile. The Nile River is like a green arrow flowing through a very arid western Sahara Desert. Up in the north, by the Mediterranean, is the blossom of a lotus tree. 
the Delta, a flat agricultural area which was the breadbasket for the pharaohs of thousands of years. 15,000 years ago, when the Mediterranean was much lower, the Nile flowed through a narrow gorge, flowed rapidly, cut down through the Delta. But as the sea rose, the river became more sluggish, and it deposited itself, forming the Delta. This natural process nourished Egypt right through until the 19th and 20th centuries. But today, things have changed. And here I'm laying on you one of the persistent themes of this lecture, which is the hazards of rising populations and cities. Here, in the Delta, we are in an area just downstream of Cairo, Cairo, one of the great medieval cities of the ancient world. Imagine a population of 3.8 million and the amount of crop land with a half meter rise in sea level. Very different from this. Or imagine if the population gets to 6 million. Look how much of that is gone. The sea is rising. It's destroying coastal mangrove swamps and lagoons. And on top of all that, the silt carried by the Nile is no longer flowing and making work because of human intervention. The building of two Aswan dams. The first one built by the British in 1899. And the second, built in the 60s, up here, which formed Lake Nassau. Now these lakes, these dams, are all very well. They abolished, however, the Nile flood. And they also abolished the enormous load of silt, which nourished not only the flood plain, but also the delta, and made it the grain bin of Egypt. It was irrigated, it was cultivated. But today, with rising groundwater, with increasingly dense urban populations in Alexandria and Cairo, which now has four million inhabitants, you are very definitely looking at a world where the amount of water is less, where the pollution of groundwater is a serious problem because of rising sea levels. And where there is now not enough food being grown to feed the projected populations of Cairo and Alexandria and Egypt generally within half a century. Add to this a country which at the moment is suffering from social disorder, and you have a very volatile situation indeed, fueled by rising sea levels, human increases in population and pollution caused by excessive drawing down of groundwater. A very sobering equation, and unfortunately, it's not unique. To go back in history again, let's have a look at this example. This is something about Mesopotamia. Here is a map of the Persian Gulf as we know it today. 12,000 years ago, when the sea levels were low, this white was the extent of the Persian Gulf. And this rose very rapidly, horizontally, and it caused the formation, thanks to the forming of the Tigris and the Euphrates, of extensive marshes which were navigated in boats. And it is here, until this century, that the famous marsh islands lived in communities among the Marines. But what's important from our point of view is that the ponding of the waters and the formation of the marsh provided a very rich environment on the edge of the flood zone, on the edge of the marshes. And it is thought that it was here that the first agricultural settlements formed some 6,000 BC, and that eventually the great 
great cities of the Sumerian civilization flourished in this area up here. Perhaps the greatest and most famous of them is the biblical site of Ur, Ali, excavated by Salem and Woolley in the 1920s and 30s. But I want you to look at that because it was built on the banks of an extremely volatile pair of rivers, particularly on the Euphrates, whose waters flood every summer as a result of rainfall and flooding far upstream in Turkey. So when you have a very severe flood year, which happened around 2000 BC, the Euphrates abruptly changes course sometimes. And one of these changes caused Earth from being a riverside city, a veritable mess, to becoming a city in a desert. And it was a bad. And the ponding of the river, more intensive flooding, and a very volatile environmental situation caused havoc in history. Because whereas villages like this can move, people living in cities and the population of Ur at that time was only around 10,000 people, where would they go? It's much harder for them to move than it was for village farmers and people like the Marsh Arabs. And indeed, today, when cities are infinitely larger, our vulnerability is even greater. What are our options in the face of rising sea levels? We can yield, as the North Sea people did. We can adapt by architecture, or we can wall ourselves off. This is the Netherlands, showing you in red the huge area of the Netherlands, which is below sea level. This blue area is almost below sea level. Here is the Zyder Sea, official yet today joined by a band. Initially, and farmers were living around here as early as 4000 BC. They adapted to rising sea levels and to storms, which we'll come back to in a moment, by building their villages on mounds, which are known to archaeologists as serpent. And these were used for many centuries and grew higher and higher. They were artificial mounds. But inevitably, these proved inadequate. And here we go on to the stage one of the great villains of rising sea levels, that of sea surges. We have no idea how many sea surges affected the Netherlands before the building of sea defenses. But there were probably dozens of them. Only a few of them were made in human memory. And one of the most notorious is one called the Ruth of Andretti, which is the great killing of people, which occurred in 1362. This killed, they estimate, 100,000 people as a minimum, and many, many more sheep and goats. You can see people here, oh, see, oh, excuse me. we have people here being rescued from the rooms of houses, frantically waiting to survive. They were completely vulnerable, as were ships, to ultra-high tides, particularly when these coincided with extremely strong gales from the southwest, when water would flow a short surge ashore, sweeping everything in front of it, because there were no defenses, the land was too low. Low luck. And remember the words of the line, the very important of modern equation. And it was about then that the Dutch decided to wall off the ocean, something they'd been doing for nearly a thousand years. They began with earthen barriers, which did not work. 
with adults. Then they started to use timbers. The only problem was the Dutch East India Company ships bought tropical worm with them, which ate the foundations. This is a stoneless land. So they had to import stone. They used seaweed. And eventually they began to develop, and they still have an absolutely unparalleled expertise in sea level physics. And the decision to wall off the Netherlands has stuck. In the 17th century, somebody invented the windmill, which allowed people to pump water from reclaimed land for borders. And today, the Dutch plan for a hundred thousand year events, and they're talking about planning that has been very shaken by the lesson of Hurricane Katrina of even longer term events. If you live in the Netherlands, in a side village, which you do here at the cost of a million dollars a foot, you don't see the ocean. You see a dike like this, and on it, flocks of incredibly fat, prosperous looking sheep. They live in an artificial wall world. And there was, finished in 18, 1987, a huge project called the Delta Works, the final stage of which was building this barrage, terminal barrage here, down by the shaft. And in the middle of it, there is an inscription which says, Here the tide is ruled by the wind, the moon, and us, human beings. Is it? That's a very bold projection. And it's interesting that the Dutch are very long-term thinkers. They are spending enormous sums of money on sea defenses. They are raising the docks in Rotterdam by a meter. They are building floating neighborhoods because they reckon that rising sea levels are here to come. Their biggest threat, which is what all this is about, are sea surges caused by extreme weather events. They had a bad spell here for Katrina when things got very lost. And extreme weather, according to people who are experts on climatology, is likely to be something that we're going to see more of in the future. So this danger, and it's very easy to have steps about it, and the media love the steps. But the issue here is a long term one. How long term? Well, if you go back to 2000 of the BC and the city of Lothal in India, which is on a river and is remarkable because it had one of the world's first artificial docks, which was connected to the river by a tidal channel shaft with stone gates. Here it is reconstructed. Warehouses, a densely populated city surrounded by sea walls. And then, in about 2000 BC, a tropical cyclone swept in, and these are very rare in this area of the Indian Ocean, brought very strong winds, heavy rain, and a sea surge. And Lothar ceased to exist. That's all that remains today. Let us have no illusions about the strength of the ocean, the strength of sea surges, the absolutely devastating effect they can have on low-lying urban populations. This is Pakistan after a sea surge and during one. But the absolute copy case of all this is, as my major general said, said, the country of Bangladesh. It is, quite simply, 
a huge floodplain fed by the Elamoli and other rivers, which are watered from the Himalayas. Average height of Bangladesh, about 38 feet above sea level. It's at the top of the Bay of Bengal. And the Bay of Bengal is like this, and it sucks in a little cycle which form far offshore and then barrel rapidly into Bangladesh. There was one earlier this year. They have one in Orissa, which is down here in India, very recently. Fortunately, owing to evacuations and forecasting, relatively few people died. The coast used to be protected by extensive mangrove swamps. Today, cities with populations in the millions are commonplace by the coast. And what is very interesting, when I got into this, it was a fascinating historical highway. There are historical records of cyclones in the 19th century, which really bring this home to roost, because these were the days before forecasts. Calcutta was a major center of the British Raj. It was a major trading port on the Huli River. It was serviced by steamships, some of them with sails. And this area was considered remote, and people really didn't think very much about cycling. They weren't that but then in 1864, an improbable cyclone arrived. And this ship here was anchored off the Holy River downstream of Calcutta. Incredible that it may seem, and the winds got up to 90 to 100 miles an hour. Heavy wind, low cloud, and an enormous sea surge. The captain kept a log of what happened. The ship dragged its anchor and was wafted ashore. It lost most of its wind. And the captain described how the ship sailed over the top of trees and went around in front of the post office. And there's a lovely account by a British police officer in the British Raj, who went on patrol after this is going to go through. What happens is the river, the water rises 10 meters, 20 feet, 30 feet, and sweeps the shore, carrying everything in front of it, including houses. And this British official took shelter in a glass hut. And he wrote in his diary, at exactly 1.30 p.m., the water reached my waist. And my watch stopped. This lovely little detail. Uh, he sheltered the rats in a palm tree and survived. But the strength of these, even today, is astronomical. The casualties until recently were routinely in the tens of thousands. The 1864 wide league killed a minimum of 70,000. This, in a population which basically lives partially afloat, they are accustomed to their houses being flooded. They have almost too much water in the monsoon season. But now they are threatened because not only are the rising sea levels and climbing populations threatening the groundwater and flooding increasingly land not temporarily, but permanently. And remember, that sea of the water flows horizontally with catastrophic results. It also is affecting the entire country because there is nowhere to go. Look at the figures for Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. These figures are really friendly. In 1970, the population of Bangladesh, Dhaka, was 1.5 million. In 2008, 
It was 8.5 million. In 2025, in a city plagued with poor water supplies, contaminated groundwater, inadequate employment, pollution and sewage problems, the estimate will be a mere 21 million people in the area. Play that on the ecological harmonia. It is truly frightening. And what the Bangladesh Major General said, and I agree with him, is that one of the great problems of the coming century, and it's a long-term problem, is that of environmental refugees. These ones of India, Indonesia, who have nowhere to go. And you're not talking about a hundred people, or thousands, you're talking about millions. And these people, many of them, are subsistence farmers with deep roots in the land. They are not, repeat, not skilled laborers. Many of them traditionally have gone into cities and sent money back to their families. But the whole situation is very, very complicated, and it is a problem that your generation is going to have to solve. Because it's in the future like a cloud, but it's really going to affect all of us. Where do you put people who live this way? They have nothing in common culturally or socially with other countries. I want to take another example. Rising sea levels. And again, sea levels. What about the problems of metals? If you look at the Maldives and the Indian Ocean, famous as a honeymoon destination, the city of Mahi, the capital, has been walled in at great expense by the Japanese. But as the Premier of the Maldives said some years ago, this will not solve the problem because in the long run we are powerless and too poor to wall off our city. Or Native American villages in Alaska. This is Shuman, Shishman, which has been a Native American village for subsistence hunters for thousands of years. It is now being eroded. What do the inhabitants do? They elect to move. The cost is astronomical. Are they going to move to cities like Rome? No. Because these cities are dry. Their subsistence hunters and the social consequences would be disastrous, apart from the fact that the inhabitants of Nome don't want them. What will happen to Shishmaya? Eventually, at last expense, it will be moved to higher ground. <coughs> or even closer to them, this is where we get the model. Contemplate New Orleans. If you go to New Orleans and you look up, you sometimes will see a freighter going by you, higher than your standard. And the Mississippi is now an artificial river. It is canalized. The Mississippi Delta is being eroded by rising sea levels. And you have millions of people living at hazard from major hurricanes. This, of course, is Hurricane Katrina, from which southern Louisiana is still slowly recovering. But the lesson is that the people who suffer most are those who can least help themselves. And the second lesson is that ultimately, your most useful mechanism for survival are the ties of kin and family and neighborhood. And in some places in Louisiana, this fault. Contemplate a Category 5 hurricane and sea surge coming ashore in New Orleans, or Miami Beach, or Fort Lauderdale. Contemplate. How would you deal with this? Would you evacuate people? And even if you do take the damage, we are extraordinarily vulnerable, not necessarily to slowly rising sea level, although there are still problems, but to the issue of extreme weather events such as hurricanes and cyclones and the devastating damage they do to modern urban industrial societies. 
The most recent in this country, of course, is Superstorm Sandy, which reduced large tracts of coastal New Jersey to rubble. What do you do? Do you rebuild at vast expense? Do you put houses on lakes? Do you rely on the forces of the marketplace, which will cause people no longer to buy houses at sea level within the sound of the breakwater and where the best houses in the most expensive or higher one? This is what they think is going to happen in parts of California when sea level rise. Or you pay the price of the bill. We live in a society which has an extremely short political attention span when really we should be looking at this problem in the context of generations. Look, another example, the other side of the world, China. How many of you have been to China? Ooh, a culture group. Shanghai is, has only one left, a spectacular skyline. It is, of course, a trading center. The Bond here was the famous British trading area. But what is generally not known is that Shanghai, which is on a coastal belt, is under attack from rising sea levels, from reduced silt owing to the building of the Three Gorges Dam, and the subsistence caused by drawing down too much of the groundwater and subsistence caused by the building of highways. And what the Chinese have done is walled off the city at vast expense. Is this the long term solution? Or will Shanghai have to be moved? The Chinese are spending money hoping it will stay there. The chances are that some catastrophic event may well cause them to change their minds. I may look at doomsday here, and I want you to think about this. Because you're talking here about millions of people. <coughs> All the famous northern Japanese tsunami in full flow here, which displaced millions of people and caused catastrophic damage. Another form of sea surge, which with rising sea levels, could be far more destructive than it was in the past. And it's very interesting to know that there were all traditions from hunter gatherers here from the 18th and 19th centuries, which know, noted that the elders of the boots knew the telltale signs of weather and impending tsunamis and moved their people to higher levels. And there were cases of villages from 6,000, 7,000 BC, which apparently were deliberately sighted on higher ground because nearby there was evidence of seawater affecting the fields. And then today, this month, Typhoon Haiyan, probably the greatest typhoon ever to hit land, an extreme weather event, a minimum of 10,000 people. Probably many more, on a low lying area where dense poor populations live, who are helpless. This is the future, and it's something that we've really got to think about, not only in the context of rebuilding, but the context of aid, but in the context of long term planning. Because there's a real chance in many parts of the world we may not be able to lift the sea level safely, but we may have to because there's nowhere for people to go. Or a more cheerful note to end. In some places, deliberate steps have been taken to yield to the ocean. This is a nice low lying area of England called. Medmary, which is a wetland which is quite densely populated with mobile home parks. And now they are flooding it deliberately. They built a land uh, defenses here 
so that this becomes, as it were, a place where the sea can overflow onto the land without hurting people. And already wildlife is coming into this area because the project has just been finished. Here is part of the earthquake. Look at the dense population there. This, in a way, is an acknowledgement of the power of the ocean. It is enormously expensive, but in the long run, generations as yet unborn will bless you for doing it. There are no easy solutions to this. It's very easy to do, which I hope you are thinking of. The end is near. Or to say, global warming is the fault. The issue is that an extraordinary challenge awaits future generations. The challenge of extreme weather events, rising sea levels, and above all, sea surges, devastating, intensely occupied coastal areas where some of the largest cities flush and are getting larger. Why? Because they're nexuses of trade. I hope I've given you food for thought. Because to me, this is an issue which really hasn't been explored, especially the issue of environmental refugees. When I think about this, I'm somewhat jealous of Atticus Caticus Catamormus, the beast to whom my book is dedicated. He has nothing to worry about except the level of food in his food bowl. Thank you and have a nice day. Now they have warning and they're using it. They've also built cyclone shelters, which are, are, are basically structures on legs. And the result is, with the recent one, that the casualty level is very low. And remember, these people are used to living in water, and the recovery rate in the natural way is fairly rapid. What is not really dealt with, and the Bangladesh is grappling with this problem, they have no easy solutions, is rising population density. That's the big issue. I'll take three more questions from now. I'm just going to go. <laughs> Anyone else? I think we've exhausted everyone. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. Professor Fagan, Professor Emeritus, he no longer goes into campus because he has a great setup at home. <laughs> Uh, he gave us a lot of examples from places far away, but I want to remind you of Orange Coastal Magazine's article last year on what's going to happen to Balboa Island in the next 50 years. Those people will be living, because they're going to construct dikes around it, in a six-foot hole in the ocean. And that doesn't even say anything about from Newport to Huntington to Long Beach in the coastal Los Angeles area. All of that will be subjected to the same thing. So it's impacting us right now. Just think about that. And while you're doing that, please go back and see our exhibit in the other room. We are going to close this exhibit at the end of December, but we invite you tonight to take part in that. Also, uh, Professor Fagan will be in that room signing books which are available for purchase for $25. And that 
book, which I've just read, goes into much greater and fascinating detail about the things he just talked about. So let's give him another round of applause. Thank you very much. 